Welcome to the Dear Katie podcast. This is Katie Kessner. And this is Claire Kaplan. Before we get started today, I want to welcome our listeners, but also to um, let everyone know that we know that the content of this podcast can be very emotionally difficult and potentially triggering for survivors of trauma. Please don't hesitate to reach out for support if you need it, whether to friends, family, or even at anonymous hotlines. You can find resource information for survivors on the Take Back the Night Foundation website. We'll share that address with you at the conclusion of the podcast. Thanks so much, Claire. It's so important to always remember how delicate this information can be. And as we always do, we're going to start from hearing with one of the letters sent to me a long time ago um, from someone along the way who was moved, inspired, or hopefully um, for the first time was sharing their own story. So let's hear from one of our Dear Katie letters. Dear Katie, you visited my high school on November 28th, 2000. I'm a senior there, and hopefully your speech taught people something. As much as our school hides it, we have a very big problem with sexual harassment and sexual assault. I know because last year in my junior year, I was sexually harassed by two guys who were hockey players. All year. I reported it many times and nothing was done. They said it was my word against the boys and brushed it off. Finally, after complaining many times, they told me to stop coming to them. They couldn't help me and would not look into my complaints any further. Okay, and now let us turn to our guest, Carrie Ann. We are so glad that you are with us and with our listeners. Um, I think everyone would love to learn a little bit about your background, who you are, um, whatever you'd like to share. So I am from Minnesota originally. I still live there, love it, (laughs) enjoy every moment of living in Minnesota, don't see myself living anywhere else. I have a bachelor's degree in criminal justice, which has changed a lot over the past year. Um, I'm also an artist. I did go to art school for a couple of years, and I live by myself with my cat, Jude, and he's seven and just crazy. Oh, nothing like a crazy cat. So... um... Lots of fun, I'm sure. So tell us about the experience that brings us to your microphone today. When I was four to about five and a half, I was sexually abused at daycare, um, a place that my mom and dad brought us to for safety. And he would bring me into the basement and abuse me while my sister slept upstairs uh, during nap time. And it caused a shift in my brain. It caused me to fracture. And I didn't find out until later that I was diagnosed with a dissociative disorder and CPTSD because of the, the abuse and the trauma that he had caused. Kiran, can you explain what CPTSD is? A lot of people are familiar with post-traumatic stress disorder, but they may not know what the C stands for. Yes. So the CPTSD is chronic. So for me, the PTSD is going to be ongoing. It's going to be lifelong. So it's something that I'm going to have to deal with every single day, most likely for the rest of my life. So for me, the symptoms of of PTSD, they look different with others, but with me specifically, um, I had a lot of flashbacks that just kind of caused a a freeze response in me to uh, one point where I was driving and I thought I was somewhere else because of the way the car was moving. And it just caused a, a flashback. And then all of a sudden, I was back in my car. Um, I have a lot of triggers, loud noises, or if it's too quiet, um, it's really difficult for me to be in a room full of people. I always have to be near an exit or be able to see an exit because I'm always worried that I won't be able to escape or get out. So for me, mostly, it's it's the loud noises, the too quiet or the flashbacks. I did have a lot of nightmares up until about four years ago. For folks who have the kind of complex PTSD you're talking about, mm-hmm. how did you, it, it sounds like you went through a number of health, mental health professionals before you found the right person and you got the kind of do- diagnosis that's working for you. How, what was that process like? Exhausting. Um, it's it gets really frustrating to go from one person to another. And for me, it was 
we would get to the harder things, the harder questions that the counselor or therapist that I was seeing at the time would ask. And I just wouldn't be able to take myself there. And I would either quit therapy or I would just not talk and sit in silence during these sessions that I'm paying for because it was just too hard for me. And going from one therapist to another is relearning how to trust, relearning, you know, the style of that therapist. And that, that in itself is exhausting. And then feeling like you are never getting better. And it's just over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. Were you ever diagnosed with like a psychosis or any of the sorts of, um, a lot of folks with the kinds of dissociative issues that you have are often misdiagnosed with those sorts of issues. Did you find yourself misdiagnosed in that way? I was diagnosed with depression for a very long time. And it's not that I, I, I do not believe that I have depression. It's also not listed on my medical paperwork anymore. And I think a lot of times what happened is they just felt that it was like a very deep depression. There wasn't really a whole lot of explanation. And for a long time I was hearing voices and really, really scared to tell anybody that I was hearing voices because I wasn't sure what that would mean in terms of a diagnosis for me or whether or not I would be committed or just be medicated for the rest of my life. So a lot of the symptoms I was having because of my dissociative disorder, I kept to myself, but I do feel like I probably mm -hmm. would have been diagnosed with something very, very different, possibly mm -hmm. schizophrenia had I said something sooner. And did you have like big blocks of blank in like blank memories, like you couldn't remember chunks of your childhood? Yes, huge chunks of my childhood that I didn't remember. And the older I got, the more I realized that the chunks of time that I was missing wasn't just from my childhood. It was from my teenage years. And then it kind of started stretching into my early 20s. And having these blocks of time that I simply cannot remember, I cannot account for, was really scary. I can imagine it would be. How did you find, how did you end up with the therapist that you have now? And, and how did you end up getting diagnosed with the correct diagnosis? Yeah, I, um, I met my now, uh, my now ex partner. Um, but I met her six years ago or so. And it was the first time I had actually felt comfortable being around another person. And I decided that was the right time for me to attempt therapy again. It had been years since I had tried because it was, it was tiring. It was exhausting, but I knew I needed help because I could hear those voices in my head all the time. And it, it became overwhelming. And because I felt like I was in a stable, healthy situation, I ended up finding a therapist who specialized in art therapy she had me take a test, a written test, a few sessions in that was to determine whether or not I had a higher level of dissociation than what was average or normal. And the following session after taking that test, she, the first thing she said to me was, well, you are a multiple and I feel like you need treatment that I'm not able to offer you. She referred me to three different therapists. She gave me the name and number. The one she really wanted me to go to was completely booked. And by some twist of fate, uh, a session, one single session with her opened up a few weeks later. And I ended up with the therapist that I have now. Wow. And the fact that this person was booked gives you an indication of how common this problem is yes um claire i i know you know so much more than i and probably many of our listeners but i carrie and i have a couple questions because i think you're mm -hmm. you know i'm trying to be all the people i've met along the way and these are two questions that came to my mind one is you're talking about something that happened to you when you were so young and a lot of us have trouble remembering anything that happened when we were, you know, four years old or five years old. Um, yet I, what I think it speaks to is that even if we have trouble remembering most of us, what happens when we were, we're that young, clearly what's going on in our developing brains and bodies is, 
indelibly imprinted, right? Whatever we, just because our brains aren't, aren't making and keeping those memories doesn't mean our body and our brain aren't taking other pieces in that may not mm-hmm. form memory exactly the way we understand it. And right. so I guess I, 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 that's my first part is I think, you know, what do you, how would you explain to just a general person um, how, you know, being that little and yet having such a huge impact on your life? Um, and, and what about the people who say, oh, well, maybe Carrie Ann, that was always the way you were. You, you know, this abuse had nothing to do with what, you know, you're dealing with right now. Could you, I think, you know, those are really important questions. They may not, you know, be fair questions, but they, I think they're the uninformed general population type questions, if you don't mind responding to those. Yeah, certainly. I, I have a six-year-old niece and she still tells me stories about how we used to go to the hotel and go swimming and have fun from when she was four, five years old. She remembers the big, huge things that had an impact on her. She remembers swimming in that pool because she had so much fun with it. And she still tells me stories about that. And for me, it's the same, just a completely opposite emotion. I do not remember from start to finish the the abuse, the daily abuse. I don't remember start to finish. I remember snippets that are scary enough that I can put those pieces together and know exactly what happened. And over my life, in my my 33 years, I've had nightmare after nightmare basically painting this picture that I am already very aware happened. I remember very specific details about the way the basement looked in particular. I remember staring at an unfinished ceiling with just the wood rafters. I I remember very small details that couldn't be remembered unless they had a huge impact on a person. And at such a young age, you don't remember all the details. You don't remember every single moment. You remember the big stuff the stuff that gave you the most rush of, of happiness or sadness or whether you were terrified. And that's what I remember. I, I remember the way it felt with him laying on top of me. I remember, I remember the red light from the camera because he was recording his abuse. I remember those, I remember those things. And when you put those pieces together, knowing that my sister went to the same daycare and she has absolutely no recollection of what that basement looks like, but I do, I could walk you through the layout of that basement and she can't. So that tells me enough to know what actually happened and enough to know that he lived blocks from my childhood home. And anytime I would drive down that road, I instantly felt uncomfortable or scared. And I had no explanation for it until I was older. And then things just kind of started coming together. Carrie Ann, that is so well said. And I think it really sheds so much light on this Mm -hmm. facet, this type of abuse, because so few people really you know, hear about it enough or understand it enough. And I think you, you really helped us understand what you experienced and its legacy on your life. Um, the other question I, I think would be, I want to go back to one other thing you said, which is it took you a long time to find a therapist and it, there's that, you know, trying to re, you know, redo everything every time you have to talk to a new one. Um, and I think that creates a lot of, for, uh, for those of us listening who are survivors and trying to find that great, helpful human to help us navigate, you know, it can seem so daunting. Like, do I really want to try it again when I haven't found anything that's worked? And it sounds like you, you would advocate that it is worth it and persevere. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Keep, keep going. I, I, there are, there are so many moments that I didn't think it would work anymore. And there were moments that I gave up and I went years without 
without help of any kind, which is what brought me to a point where I knew that if I didn't get help, I wasn't going to make it. And I no longer cared about what the diagnosis was. I didn't care anymore. I just wanted the internal noise to stop. And if you can avoid doing that, just go through the process. Find a therapist, no matter how terrifying it is, no matter how many you have to go through, it is worth it to keep trying. Kirian, you talked about those internal voices. And a lot of people get confused and think, well, why weren't you just diagnosed? But you said you didn't mention them, but isn't that just schizophrenia? Can you talk a little bit about what the difference is? Um, explain that difference between what, you know, the dissociative disorder that you have and what schizophrenia is? So I, I learned this the day that uh, the art therapist told me that I was a multiple. She asked me if the voices in my head were telling me to do things. And I said, no. And she said, how do they sound? How do they sound in your head? And I explained to her that they all, for the most part, sound like me, but there are some that have like a different uh, tone in their voice. Some are deeper, some are a little bit higher pitched, but they are all essentially my voice. And the difference for her that she explained was if I do not have an intrusive voice that is telling me to do something that is consuming my life, that is not schizophrenia. Um, for me, it was a lot of internal noise that we were all working together to collectively to keep me from crumbling. That's a great explanation. And I guess to further explain, those are all, all those voices were you, but they were different parts of you. Yes. So, and some were, they kind of express different parts in when there's a different kind of need. You talked about having these big blanks of memory. Is that is that also an indication of your dissociative disorder? And what do you know? Did you ever recollect or did you ever find out what those blanks did? You, were you able to able to fill those blanks? I guess that's my question. I have been able to fill some of them, never completely. I have, I am, I am lucky enough to have a very strong support system, but it's also a support system that I've had since I was in middle school. I have had the same two best friends since I was 11, 12 years old. So they've watched me. They've seen, you know, they've seen me go through life. They've also had moments where I've said or done things that they didn't recognize. And I have been able to really rely on them to help fill in some holes or some some things that I may not remember doing. I got into a huge argument with my one of my dear friends because I apparently had told her that she could have my television. It caused a fight that lasted almost a week because I had no recollection of telling her any of that. And it finally came down to me trusting her enough to believe what she was telling me and it's because a different part, a different altar had given her my TV. So some of those, some of those things rely solely on trust on my part. I have to trust what other people tell me happened, which is really scary. And other, other memories that have come back have happened through therapy. So I have gotten some memories back. But I don't know that those missing pieces will ever be completely whole. I think they'll always just be bits and bits and pieces that I hope one day maybe will come back. And maybe the pieces that are gone should be gone. And I might have to just learn how to accept that. What is the goal of your therapy? What is, um, what is the process for you? <clears throat> the goal of my particular treatment plan is just to basically get everyone to communicate with one another to not allow certain parts that are significantly stronger than others to come forward to take over my body to take over my mind and do things that cause an amnesic barrier to where when I do kind of come back to myself I don't remember things that's the goal is to avoid that type of situation and 
the way my therapist explains it to me is we're trying to create new neural pathways. We're trying to connect those neural pathways that have been, in essence, broken. They've been fractured, separated from one another, which is how a dissociative disorder is formed. So the goal is to try and get everyone to communicate with one another and discuss before a dissociation happens. And are you finding that your community, for lack of a better term, is becoming more integrated? Um, for me, integration has is is difficult because I know that for some individuals with DID or dissociative disorder, their aim is integration, which is basically just to have one singular voice internally. And some, and for some, integration means not wanting to hear them at all. Um, and which is fine. It's, it's completely individual to the person. For me, what was decided a few years ago in therapy was that I do not wish to live as an, in, like a singular person. I don't know anything different than hearing, you know, my different alters. I don't know anything different. And for me, it would be very lonely and very scary to not hear these, you know, these people that have been with me my entire life. So my whole goal is just to get everybody, my entire community to communicate with one another and not just barge in to a conversation or try to control something that I'm doing. And that that's been working really, really well for me. That's great to hear. How would you talk about who you've become and what it has happened in a positive way. Like, what does it mean to you to say, I'm good with this. I like, I like all these people around me. I like the many pieces of me. Yeah. Um, I am not broken and I don't need to be fixed. And if at any point I feel that there are pieces of me or there is something about me that I would like to change, I would like to work on, that's my decision and not someone else's. I I am not going to let somebody else tell me how I'm going to pick up the pieces of something that another person broke. That's That's not acceptable to me. And I think it's up to every individual, any, any person who's been assaulted or raped, it, it's it's up to them. And that is, that's one of the really harsh things about, about sexual assault, especially because it's got such a, a negative stigma attached to it. It's just this, well, we can't talk about it, or you shouldn't talk about it, or you should be okay. Well, I'm, I'm, I wasn't okay. For a really long time, I wasn't okay. And now that I am okay, it seems kind of cruel for people to say, well, just get over it. Well, no, because I worked really hard to get myself back. And, and basically it just comes down to, I'm not going to apologize for how I put myself back together. And if I choose to share my experience, that's a part of my process. And I get to do that. Carrie and I like, yeah, I like thinking about the part where you, where you you keep you said I'm okay, I'm okay, and I think that it's interesting to think about someone who has triggers or who has, you know, psychological angst angst here and there, that mm-hmm. I'm still okay, and I I think that we're constant. Sometimes we create more anxiety when we try to think that we're going to, you know, somehow stop up all the holes. And sometimes the holes themselves are beautiful. Sometimes I think, okay, the fact that I have this trigger around a certain smell, or I have this trigger, I can use it as an asset. Like, I don't have to say I want to fix all of it. Um, I Can you speak to that too? Like, what does that mean to you to say like, out of, you know, when, when certain mul- of you know, who you are when these different pieces surface, how are they assets to you? I use my particular, uh, my particular disorder as a learning tool, as an educational tool. 
because I, I think it's important to advocate for others who maybe have a hard time advocating for themselves or speaking up for themselves. My mom, oh, bless her, by the way, but my mom the other day asked me which one of my altars, which one of my parts wears a hat because she said, well, you don't, you, you don't wear a hat very, very often. And I, I sat her down and I said, mom, sometimes a hat is just a hat. And it, <laughs> and it opened up a conversation about my alters and how they behave and things that they do to soothe themselves. So one of my alters likes to wear a hat when she's feeling uncomfortable. So I will put on a hat. It doesn't mean that she has taken over my body. It means I'm working with her to help her soothe herself. And that's a conversation that I had to have with my mom, which was very difficult. But having a conversation about your triggers or having a conversation with somebody about something that is maybe not understood or misunderstood, I think is really, really important. And even the thing that I have with the loud noises, I purchased, they're called loops. They're called loop earbuds. And you just put them in your ear. You can't really see them. They kind of look like earrings. And I sat down and I explained to her why I purchased them, why I have a hard time with loud noises. And having that conversation with somebody who doesn't understand allows them to have that conversation with another person they meet that may not understand. And it kind of breaks down that stigma. Um, I have a question about your family. And um, when did they become aware of this and... Um, of your abuse and then your diagnosis and, and how did they handle it? So they were not aware of my diagnosis until six months ago. And um, they were aware of the abuse maybe a year ago. And it kind of went unspoken for a while. I told my mom first and a few months later I told my sister and my sister has had a really hard time letting it go. I chose not to tell them who it was that had abused me at first because I was worried that my mom would, you know, lose her mind or feel guilt, you know, for putting me in daycare. And no mother should feel guilt for putting their child in daycare. That's, And I didn't want her to feel that. And my sister still feels guilt for being upstairs the entire time sleeping, you know, while I was being abused. So I chose not to share my disorder with my family other than one of my cousins. Up until my breakup, my my most recent breakup about seven months ago when my now ex said, you have to tell somebody. You have to tell people because if you keep this to yourself anymore, it's going to hurt you. You have to tell people. And I realized she was right. And I had to just take a leap and tell my family. How did she convince you, your partner, that it would hurt people not to tell? I'm curious. That's a, that's a big step, <laughs> Carrie Ann. And, and it takes um, sometimes, you know, shattering that silence is one of the themes of what we're trying to do is let's talk about this. And how, what was it that she said that helped you think, oh, I'm going to, I'm going to try this? She is the uh, first person that I've ever been with that I have felt not crazy. And that's really difficult to, to do with this particular disorder. It's very difficult to not feel like you are insane or living living so separately from people because they, they don't understand. And I, I trusted her. And my entire community trusted her and still do. Um, so when she told me something that important, that life altering, I had to choose whether or not to trust her. Like I had so many times before, even though we were broken up, I had to choose whether or not to trust her. And my normal pattern <laughs> would be to not trust to not trust her, to not trust my friends, that they weren't going to leave or hurt me. And I, I took the leap of faith to change my own pattern and trust her. And it was the right decision. 
and I'm glad that I did. And it, I'm, I'm just, I'm glad that I, I'm glad that I trusted that. And I think she knew that telling me to tell other people was the only way that I was going to feel free. I love that because what it speaks to for our survivors, our listeners, is that when you can support someone else and show them this unfettered commitment to who they are, embracing all that they are, and you link, you link in that oh so vulnerable way, then when they turn around and they say, try one more thing for me. I'm here for you unconditionally and try one more thing. And I I'm, I know you deep, wide, dark, light. I know all of you. Try this one more thing. And you did. And, it, and it's so brilliant. Even if you two aren't together now, the fact that you had that moment with another person and they were there for you, I think it, it helps us. Even if we have heartbreak and heartache after, <laughs> It's, yeah. it's just it's so beautiful. It's just so beautiful. And I think it's where we need to go as survivors is we have to, it's so hard to be that vulnerable and to feel like we're less than all the time. And finally someone to say, nope, you're more than. And yeah. that's what your partner did for you. And, you know, it, it, wherever you two are now, I think you clearly are in a much better, more brilliant place. So Thank you for sharing that because I think it's going to help tons of us, tons of us. Thank you. Thank you. And to that end, um, Carrie Ann, what, what's happening now? What's the future for you? Oh, for me, I, the, the options are wide open for me now uh, in a way that I never thought they would be. Like I said, said in the beginning, I have a degree in criminal justice. I worked in a law firm in social security disability law for five years. And once I went through my breakup, I had to move home. I no longer could see myself sitting at my desk day in and day out doing work that didn't matter to me. That wasn't, it, it wasn't helping anyone. And after deciding to tell my family out of necessity as well, because I was worried that I was going to dissociate it just because of the amount of emotion I was going through with my breakup, I realized that I no longer wanted to do anything that didn't make me feel good about myself. I quit my job. I moved to my sister's house to kind of help heal myself and be around my beautiful nieces and children help everything when it when you're feeling sad. And I was unemployed for a little while. I just got a job working at a homeless, uh, it's a, I'm an adult shelter advocate. I'm helping individuals who are houseless find somewhere to sleep. And that's very fulfilling. I just finished my first book. I do plan on writing more after this first one is published. Uh, I wrote a book about my dissociative disorder and how each different part or alter was created and the the trauma they experienced and what I do and don't remember in hopes that it'll help somebody else avoid some of the sadness that I felt for so long and it led me here so it seems that my the life I thought I was going to have has changed so much so dramatically and so much for the better since talking about something that I have so deeply suffered with for so long and now I have the opportunity to help others so that's where I'm at right now in my life Carrie Ann that's so exciting um can you tell us the, the title of the book do you have that selected yet I do it's called you can't keep us so we hope our listeners will stay tuned and and Um, Keep looking for um, the publication of your book. I'm very excited. Well, congratulations on that. That's a wonderful accomplishment. Thank you. Well, this has been a fantastic time with you, Carrie Ann. Thank you so much for sharing um, your story, your journey, journey, your your triumphs, um, and and your your dark places as well. Um, uh, We really, really appreciate you. And and for our, our listeners, our 
our participants, our survivors, our supporters, we thank you for taking this journey um, with another one of our survivors. So this has been Katie Kessner. And this is Claire Kaplan. And if you need to find out more resources, don't forget to visit tapebackthenight.org. So this has been our, our Dear Katie podcast, and we look forward to another episode, another survivor, another Dear Katie letter. Um, for now, we, we work toward shattering the silence and ending the violence.